America, presented by DuPont. The Stolen General, a drama of America's first anniversary of the 4th of July. Adapted for radio from a story by Marquis James. Starring John Garfield as Colonel William Bott. The DuPont Company... Makers of better things for better living through chemistry, tonight present a young American actor who, in brief three years, has risen from relative obscurity to stardom. John Garfield. New York theater goers first became aware of John Garfield for his performance in Having a Wonderful Time. Later, Hollywood claimed him, and the country cheered his performance in Four Daughters, Dust Be My Destiny, and other films. At present, he is rehearsing in his new stage play, Heavenly Express, which shortly will be seen in the nation's capital. Tonight on Cavalcade of America, he makes one of his infrequent radio appearances, playing the role of Colonel William Barton in The Stolen General. The afternoon of July 3rd, 1777, the headquarters of Colonel Stanton, in command of a regiment of colonial militia at Tiverton, Rhode Island. The colonel looks up as his second-in-command, Lieutenant Colonel William Barton, enters. Colonel Stanton. Yes, Barton? By the coffins outside. Just escaped the British. Coffin. Have him come in. Coffin. Coffin. Colonel Stanton wants to see you. Colonel Stanton, I... I... Here, here. Sit down, man. What happened? Coffin, how'd you do it? How'd you ever get out of the British camp? Sneaked out at night. Made a run for it. The party for General Prescott at the Overing house, and I took the chance. So that goose-faced Tory Overing is entertaining the British peacock, huh? More than that, Colonel Barton. Prescott quartered in his house. Just across the water. Newport Island. Not far, either. Ah, uh, he's there, all right. The cock of the war, crowing all over the place about how we'll never win this war. We'd best bow down before our English betters and let them tell us how to live. He sits up there on the porch of the Overing house all day. Him and Overing talking about their army. The British... Part of the sort of place you've got here, Overing. Not England, of course, but not bad. Foul, hot weather, though, and only July. Man must have his little comfort, you know, even if he is putting down a rebellion. It's an honor to have you, General. I'm awfully sorry about the weather. That's the way it goes in this country. Oh, what will your rebel neighbors do to you, Overing, if things don't turn out our way? Hmm? Good heavens, General, you... You don't think there's any chance of that, do you? My dear Overing, in a war, one side is bound to win, you know. That's the point. I know, General, but... Who are you? You're trying to frighten us. <laughs> oh, I think I did, eh, Overing? Well, don't worry. These rascally rebels haven't a chance. Not one chance in a thousand. And every mother's son of them will regret it from Washington down before we get through with them. General... Why, they're all silly beginners, ragged and starving and beaten, too. Only they haven't the sense to know it. I hear a good many of them are deserting every day. Absolutely. The whole ridiculous rebellion is falling apart. Oh, <laughs> here. I have a splendid idea. Very amusing. Collins! Lost it all. Where's that loafing orderly? Collins! Yes, General. Oh, there you are at last, Collins. Give me my fan, will you? And bring me one of those rebel prisoners my men caught yesterday. Yes, sir. What are you going to do with them, gentlemen? May I ask? Oh, just a little sport, Overing. I want to show you what sort of jackanapes you're quaking in your boots about. Patriot. Bah. I wager we could get any of them to quit if they got the chance. Here's one of the prisoners, General. Coffin, private. Rhode Island militia. Never mind his title, Collins. You may go. Overing. <laughs> Look at the beggar. Now you see what sort of scarecrow soldier his majesty's army is obliged to bother with. All they need is a chance to desert. I dare say uh, this fellow was rather pleased to be captured. Eh? Now that's a lie. Here, you can't Get up, you come. rotten Tory. You and the rest of the dirty traitors will get what's coming to you someday. I'll smack your head for that, you blasted rebel. Now, now, Overing, don't be silly. You hot, fighting gentlemen, who really? sight their inferiors. I've got a bit of an idea. I say, Collins. Collins, hang it, man, you're deaf. 
He established what his name, back with my orders, and give him a dozen lackeys. And then I let this take it uh, two dozen. Make it take this to do. Yeah, yes, sir. <laughs> C- come on, you. Uh, do go away now, Overing. That's a good fellow, will you? This heat suffocating. Oh, what a place. What a war. God, I wish it was over. Well, the truth is I... That's a story, Colonel Barton. The kind of swine General Prescott is. Look at my back, Colonel Stan. Butcher. Coffin, you better see Dr. Williams. He put some salve on those welts. Thanks, Colonel. I'll go now. Coffin. Yes, Colonel. There's Newport Island well guarded. Prescott's got a company of light horse with him at the Overing Estate. There's a company of infantry there, too. Two companies, huh? I tell you this. There's only one sentry before the house. Only one sentry? You sure, Coffin? Only one sentry? Yes, I... I saw him myself. Good. That's very interesting, Coffin. Thanks. Report back to duty as soon as you can, Coffin. Won't be long, sir. I'm not missing a chance to pay those redcoats back. Blasted British cutthroats. Colonel Stanton. Yes? I'm going up to Newport Island to get Prescott. You're going what? And I'll bring him back a prisoner. Barton, you're a fool. Watch me. Well, don't be insane, man. The British fleet's guarding Newport Island. You heard Coffin say Prescott's protected by infantry and cavalry at the Overing Estate. What? I never heard anything so fantastic. I heard Coffin say there's only one sentry guarding the house. One sentry. Well? It's ridiculous. I won't allow it. But listen, Colonel Stanton. Only one sentry between us and the general. And only the British war squadron between you and the sentry. But you'd be blown out of the water before you got half started. I know it can be done, or I wouldn't try it. Give me 40 Rhode Island oarsmen who know these water better than any man alive. Give me a dark night, and we'll slip past that squadron and press its hours. The Americans need something to perk up their spirits. That'll make the British look silly and give us a real Fourth of July celebration. Absurd, Barton. You can't do it. And I won't be responsible for ordering men to risk certain death on any scheme as crazy as that. Well, look, Colonel, the British have captured General Lee. He was second in command of the American army. Well, we get Prescott. We exchange Prescott for Lee. Well, Colonel? Oh, I don't know, Barton. I wish you wouldn't tempt me this way. Parade the regiment. Let me call for volunteers. Well, all right. It still doesn't make sense. But if you get your 40, go ahead. If not, we'll forget the whole thing and let me worry about Prescott. Colonel, you'll have nothing to worry about. Attention! Stand up, Keith! Men, Colonel Stanton has given me permission to find out how many of you would be willing to accompany me on a secret and dangerous expedition. That's all I can say about it now. But I tell you, boys, it's for freedom. And don't forget, tomorrow is the 4th of July. Any man ready to volunteer without hearing any more about it, and what I've just told you, will step three paces forward. Well, Colonel Stanton, that's more than 40. It's the whole regiment. You win, Barton, but you can't take them all. Don't need to. Men, thanks for your spirit, but I can't use all of you. I've got it. Here's what we'll do. Tomorrow we're having boat races. The first five crews to cross the finish line will report to me at the cove. That will make an even 40 in all. Just the right number of good oarsmen. I'll say you. Thank you, man. Well, there we are, Colonel. Good luck, Barton. You'll need it. Thanks, Colonel. Now we'll show you one way to celebrate the 4th of July. can see us out here. Mighty dark. I'll tie my handkerchief to this pipe here. They ought to be able to see that. Must be drawing near the warships, Colonel. Shh. No more talk, man. There's the British fleet ahead to port. A dozen warships. Take it slow. Easy. What's that? My oar broke, sir. Watch it now. Shh. Who's out there? Don't move a muscle, man. Hold still. Who's out there, I say? What's the matter, mate? Water in a boat. 
Tony! Anybody there? Not a sound base. You dreamed it. Well, that won't be nothing in its rain. Oh, pills and all's well. I guess we're safe now. Go. 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 That's it, lad. Go. Go. Not many yards to shore now, sir. I can just make it out. Good. Now, I, I want to make sure we have this light, Hunt. You think the dragoons will be quartered how far from the house? The stable is about 200 yards south side of the house, sir. The infantry would most likely be camping far on the other. Good. And the house is about a mile from the beach, huh? Yes, sir. And about halfway, there's a gully with high banks. Uh huh. Good. It'll shield us till we get near the house. But that rain is letting up. In a minute, the moon will come out and they'll be seeing us on shore. What do we do, sir? Hurry up. Rope faster. We can get cover on shore. Pull. 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 That's it, man. Good. Here's something on shore. Shh. It must be the dragoons on patrol, sir. Quiet, not a sound. They stopped quiet. What's going on, sir? Do you think they saw it? I don't know, Hunt. Moon's almost sailing out from behind that cloud. They might have. Listen. They're gone. We're safe. Can you tell whether they're going away from the house or to it, Hunt? I'd get away, sir. Then we may be lucky again, lad. All right, lad. Here it is. Pull. Pull for sure. Pull. 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 Easy, lad. Hear anything? No, sir. The horseman must be firing away by now. I hope so, Potter. Are we all beached? How about the others? They're pulling on shore now, sir. Good. Wilcox. And Phillips. That got you, sir. Hunt will show us the way. Your squad follow mine. Shh. Must be the dragoons again. Seems there's not much time, sir. We'd better hurry. Aye. Right. Wilcox. Adam. Yes, sir. Your squad cover the sides and rear of the house. Phillips. Yes. Yours the road. That cock. Stand by for emergency. Watch out for the dragoons. You men remaining here, get the boats turned around. We'll have to get away fast. The rest of you come with me up to the house. Quiet around here, sir. I see a sign of a light in the house. Shh, look. The sentry. I'll go first, Hunt. When I pin them down, be ready. Yes, sir. Shh. Who comes there? Who comes there? Just a friend, lad. Can't friend and be recognized. Tell me, have you seen any deserters tonight? Deserters? What? Quiet. Quiet. All right, lad, come on. I've got him. Quiet now. This is much. One sound out of you locks the back and you're a dead man. Gag ready? Aye, sir. There. He's tight, all right. Stay by him, Daniel. If anything looks suspicious while we're inside the house, give a low whistle. Yes. Now, follow me, lad. Quiet. Watch yourself. Mr. Overing, sir? Yes, I'm Overing. Why, you... You blew out my candle. I believe you did it on purpose. There's enough light for what we want. What do you want? Why are you, what are you doing here? Sorry, right, but I have urgent dispatches from Newport for General Preston. Better show them to Major Barrington before disturbing the general. Where's the light? If you'll just show us the way to General Preston, Mr. Overing. We, we can do without a light, thank you. He's acting strangely for a courier. I don't believe... Never mind what you believe, Overing. Where's Preston? Well, you're not even British. You are. American. Yes, you toy dog. Now, where's Prescott? Quick. I won't tell you. You... Quiet. 
This has got a lot of talk in yours if you want noise. See? Now then. You think I'll surrender again, Will Prescott? What's You're... going on out there? Everybody, what's going on, I say? Tell him it's all right. Go on, my pistol may go off in the wrong time. Quick. It's all right, General. Nothing wrong. Tell him he has visitors on a matter of importance. I... Go on, go on, say it. You have visitors, General, on a matter of vital importance. They insist upon seeing you, sir. I beg you. Well, who are they? What do they want? Tell him you're bringing us in, O'Brien. Come on. I'm bringing them, General. Yes, yes, we'll be right there. Not so fast, Overy. Let me get into something. Who are these visitors? I don't believe I know their names, sir. But... Don't be ridiculous, Overy. Do you mean to say you admitted them without finding that out? Who are you, sir? What does this mean? Colonel Barton, Rhode Island militia. You're my prisoner. You hear, Overy? You traitor! No, no, General, please. I see it now. You regret this overing. That's enough of this quiet. Out of bed, General, and start dressing. I'm accustomed to giving orders. I don't take them from ragged rebels. Have it your own way, General, but you look better in clothes instead of a nightshirt. You're coming with us. Last them out, lad. One, right, two, three. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, me, I had to follow your advice. You better. Here's your waistcoat. Quick. Thank you. Now. Better hide, sir. I saw a light off near the stable. Come along, General. You'll have to dress later. But I can't go this way with only a night shirt and my waistcoat and it in bare legs. Where's my britches? Where's my britches? Quiet, General. Opening. Where are the General's britches? Quick. Here. There they are. Oh, thank you, Overing. But this will mitigate your punishment only slightly. When His Majesty says of oh, sir, you don't still believe that I had anything to do with this. Don't stand there like a carp, Overing. Hand me the britches. Somebody must be coming. You're right, quick. A couple of you lads better tie Overing up and gag him, put him in the general's bed. No time for your britches now, General. Bring him along, lads. Mm-hmm. Now listen, General. We've got to get you out of here quickly and quietly. And if you let one peep out of you, I'll blast you right out of that nightshirt. Come on, man. You have to go to fast, Barton. This is an outrage, an outrage. If you don't keep quiet and hurry along, General, you'll find out what a real outrage is going to be. Ouch! These brambles are scratching my legs. Just a minute. We can fix that, General. Awesome. Then make a hand chair for the General to ride in style. Uh, riding along like this bare-legged night shirt. Why, George, I haven't even got the sword. Come now, that's a serious mistake indeed. Who ever heard of a general without a sword? Who'll volunteer to go back for the general's sword? I'll go back, sir. All right, Daniel. You mean to say you think you can go back for it? Well, shouldn't we? Come, the etiquette, General. How could you surrender without it? But, Daniel, yes. remember, you'll have to hurry. We can't wait too long for you at the boat. You won't have to, sir. I'll be there with it almost as soon as you. Getting past that British fleet again is going to be our last risk. Then we'll be, we'll be back in camp again. Hurry, lads. Thank heaven the moon's disappeared. We've got to make for the boats and be off. reporting, sir. Delivering my prisoner, General Prescott. General Prescott? General Prescott? Oh, come off that horse play. You know me well enough, Stanton. I suppose I have you to thank for this. No, no indeed, General. On the contrary, sir, we are grateful to you for the honor of this visit. In fact, we are deeply indebted to Colonel Barton for persuading you to come, sir. Uh, what's up? What's wrong out there? Colonel Stanton. Yes. I beg pardon, sir, but a message has arrived here under a flag of truce. Flag of truce? I believe he's from Newport, sir. Admit him. Yes, sir. I don't know what this can be, a flag of truce. Colonel Stanton, see now. Right this way. Oh, General Prescott, I keep my horse as quickly as I could, sir. I have your wardrobe, sir. General Prescott, do you know this man? Of course I know him. 
My orderly, you know. That time I received some attention. Are you all right, sir? Did they harm you? It's all so shocking. The staff is terribly upset. You can reassure my staff that I have been treated with proper respect. Well, thank heaven for that, sir. I also brought you a purse, sir. In case you wanted anything, these uh, persons refused to supply. And I also thought to bring you this bottle of perfume. Uh, I beg pardon, Colonel Barton. Him who kept the general standing long enough, he must be exhausted. Certainly, Potter, you're right. Do sit down, General. Forgive us our rudeness. Uh, sounds like your loutish Yankee sense of humor to me. Oh, no, General, I assure you, quite the contrary. Everything must be of exceptional satisfaction to you. May, you must rely on that. We trust you'll be comfortable, General, in your temporary quarters before going on to Providence. Thank you, Colonel. I'm sure I will be. May I retire now to freshen up a bit for the journey? Certainly. Potter, I detail you to escort General Prescott to his quarters. Yes, sir. Ben? Ancient? Why, thank you. Uh, this way? Uh, this way, General Prescott. Uh, orderly, be sure to bring along the General's perfume. Pass to you, General. Orderly. Ah! <laughs> 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 oh, it was a good job, Parson. Wait till the news of this gets around the country. The best thing that could have happened at this time. A great job, my boy. Excellent. <laughs> Colonel, you should have seen him without his britches. <laughs> and a laugh rings out from New Hampshire to Georgia. People laugh and soldiers laugh, from the rawest recruit to the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. As that laugh went up, with it rose the spirit of the Americans. At length, the fight for freedom was over and won. Then one day, some years later in New York, in the office of President George Washington... Mr. President. Oh, yes, Mr. Beer. Uh, several callers waiting there. Mr. Adams, Williamson, and uh, uh, Colonel Spock. Spock? Do you suppose that could be the Colonel Barton, the one who captured Prescott? He said he was from somewhere in New England, sir. He may be. Colonel Barton? Where? Where? The others can wait, Mr. Lear. Send Colonel Barton in. Oh, uh, wait. Uh, get my clipping book, sir. See if you can find that item from the London Chronicle and bring it to me. I'm very good, sir. Well, come in, Colonel. Come in. How do you do? So, you're Colonel William Barton. I'm glad. Very glad to see you. Thank you, sir. I've just been in the city for a few days, my first visit in years, and I wish to pay my respects. Thank you. I've always wanted to meet you. Well, what are you up to these days, Colonel Bob? Well, I'm living in Vermont, Mr. President. Things have been going well. I, I really have nothing to complain of. We've got all that we wanted freedom and a country of our own to live in. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, ah, here's the clipping you asked me to Thank you. Yes. Yes, this is it. Barton, here's something to interest you. A bit of doggerel I saved from the London Chronicle. Uh, it's September 23rd, 1777. I'll wager you haven't heard it. Well, I don't know, Mr. President. What's it about? I'll read it to you, Colonel. <clears throat> Othello cries the handkerchief. I prize it more than riches. A different note for Prescott Raws. For naught resounds the Atlantic shores. But where, oh, where's my bridges? <laughs> no, <laughs> tell me. What do you think of that tribute? Uh, very unfriendly of the chronicle, I always thought. I'm flattered, sir, that you thought enough of it to say it. Thought enough of it? I'll never forget, Colonel Barton, how much we needed that exploit of yours. I was saying something like that. I remember how dark it seemed. You know, for going advancing. Everything seemed lost. And then you showed it. Showed all the stories and all the people. What a handful of men to be. It is like a cloud, Colonel Bob. A dark cloud. Lifted by the needle. Thank you, Mr. President. I don't know if any of us thought of it that way. I always think of it as the first fourth of July. <laughs> By his celebration of the first Fourth of July, William Barton struck an effective blow at British authority and prestige, and a blow for American independence. But the reason it appealed so strongly to the American colonists 
was because it expressed their own and America's sense of humor. And for his courage and enterprise, William Barton tonight takes a rightful place in the cavalcade of America. <laughs> Thank you, John Garfield. We are happy to have you as our guest on the Cavalcade of America. And now, before we hear from Dr. Monaghan about next week's program, we have a story from the wonder world of chemistry. Visitors to Port Petrol in Southern California these days see a curious sight. A big ship comes to anchor more than half a mile offshore. It is a tanker, ready to load up with oil. The sailors hook a cable to a buoy floating in the water alongside and haul up a gigantic hose, a foot in diameter, and 180 feet long. This hose is attached to a pipe that lies on the ocean floor and connects with storage tanks near the shore. Oil is pumped into the ship, and then the hose is dropped back into the ocean. One of the chief reasons why this method of loading is so efficient is that the big submarine hose is lined with neoprene, the amazing chemical rubber developed by DuPont chemists. Natural rubber wouldn't do for a lining because oil or gasoline would soon destroy it. But even though the oil has to be heated to above 120 degrees to make it flow easily, this chemical rubber can take it. Neoprene's ability to resist oil and grease and chemicals comes a lot closer to your daily life than the job of loading tankers on the Pacific coast. When you stop at the service station to get gas, chances are that the gasoline is pumped through a neoprene-lined hose. As a matter of fact, neoprene is used for conveying petroleum products every step of the way from the oil well to the engine of your car or the oil burner in your basement. And in jobs where men have to walk on oily, greasy floors, as in garages or packing plants, they're wearing shoes with neoprene soles. And up in the sky, airplanes are flying through the clouds with neoprene fuel tanks, like football bladders tucked inside the wings. Now, neoprene does beauty in your own kitchen, too, because neoprene resists the softening effect of grease and cleaning preparations. Sink scrapers, strainers, soap dishes, and drain board mats are being made of it. And housewives find neoprene gloves last much longer than rubber gloves for dishwashing, polishing furniture, painting, and other household tasks. So you see what a variety of needs are served by the unique qualities of this DuPont development. The chemical rubber that has its beginning in a strange combination of raw materials. Limestone, coal, and salt. It looks and acts like natural rubber, but it's superior in many ways. The special services provided by neoprene are another illustration of the DuPont pledge, better things for better living, through chemistry. And now, the Cavalcade of America's historian, Dr. Frank Monahan of Yale University. At the close of our broadcast on Sam Houston, earlier in the present series, Destiny, chiefly in the person of Andrew Jackson, was directing Houston to the western horizons of America, to Texas. Next week's program portrays the brilliant consummation of this unusual career, this is a story of how, following the massacre at the Alamo, Houston led a ragged remnant of sections in one of history's most extraordinary retreats. Suddenly he stopped, wheeled about, destroyed the larger Mexican army, and captured General Santa Ana, president of Mexico. By this, Houston won the independence of Texas, and thus paved the way for the American annexation of that fabulous empire, which is the Lone Star State. <laughs> Next week, the Cavalcade of America again is happy to announce that the distinguished American actor, Walter Houston, will again play the leading role in its concluding drama of the colorful career of Sam Houston, The Raven Wins Texas. On tonight's program, the orchestra and musical effects run under the direction of Don Voorhees. This is Basil Rysdale saying good night and best wishes from DuPont. This is the National Broadcasting Company.